Hello, good morning, and welcome to An Academy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. Let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu Newspaper. These are the topics that we shall be discussing today, beginning with an article on page number one of the Delhi edition of The Hindu, relevant for GS Paper 2. Last Wednesday, a petitioner approached a single judge bench of the Calcutta High Court with a complaint that there are irregularities in the way caste certificates are issued. These caste certificates would be used to get admission, to seek admission in various medical colleges, basically alleging a fake caste certificate scam. Wednesday morning, a single judge bench of the Calcutta High Court, what he is doing? He is ordering a CBI probe. Same day in the afternoon, now a two-judge bench, a division bench of the Calcutta High Court. A division bench of the Calcutta High Court stays this CBI probe. Doesn't matter what CBI does, registers an FIR. What the Calcutta High Court is saying that we are livid. How can CBI proceed with this case when the division bench of the Calcutta High Court has stayed the CBI investigation into this? Not just this, this single judge bench of the Calcutta High Court, the judge is alleging that these two judges or one of these two judges is acting at the behest of a particular political party. So now there is a clash confrontation between two judges of the Calcutta High Court. Matter reached the Supreme Court. Supreme Court took so moto cognizance of this matter, acted on its own without somebody approaching the Supreme Court. Supreme Court took the matter in its own hands and now a five judge bench five-judge constitution bench of the Supreme Court, headed by Chief Justice of India, Justice Chandrachur, is going to hear this matter on January 29. The state government, which approached the division bench of the Calcutta High Court, after which the division bench stayed the CBI inquiry or investigation into this case, now state bank, state government is also approaching the court. And on the other side, the central government, represented by the Attorney General for India and Solicitor General, they are also making their arguments. State government is saying, how can a single judge bench of the Calcutta High Court order a CBI probe when the petitioner did not ask for a CBI probe? So normally the court grants relief, such as ordering a CBI probe, if the petitioner is asking for this. In this case, the petitioner who alleged irregularities in the way caste certificates are distributed are granted. The petitioner did not ask for the CBI probe. So how did the single judge bench of the Calcutta High Court order the CBI probe? That's the argument of the state government. On the other hand, the central government, represented by the Attorney General for India and Solicitor General, what they are saying is that, my lord, there is a 1985 Supreme Court judgment. which clearly says that if a bench of the High Court has given any order, unless and until this order is appealed, unless and until this order copy has been fully dissected by the court, you cannot impose a stay. So the central government is saying, how can this division bench impose a stay on the CBI probe when this division bench did not get the copy, did not read the copy of the single judge bench of the Calcutta High Court. So who is right, who is wrong? We don't have to go too deep into that. We will have to wait and watch what happens on January 29. But let's look at the larger issue. What is the larger issue? For example, there is a petitioner. He files a case in the district court, loses it files an appeal before the High Court loses it. Now, what is the option available to this petitioner? This petitioner should ideally approach the Supreme Court because Supreme Court is the highest court of appeal. 
but look at the costs involved. He has to get a lawyer of the Supreme Court, advocates on record at the Supreme Court. He has to get the lawyer who assisted him in the High Court, take him to the Supreme Court, boarding, lodging, food, travel expenses. And when this petitioner is calculating all the costs, he decides against approaching the Supreme Court, drops his idea of filing an appeal against the High Court order, the problem solved. That means Supreme Court is not accessible to a vast majority of the people of this country, particularly in Northeast or deep South in India. This is where various state governments, this is where various associations, Bar Association of India, State Bar Association, in fact, the Parliamentary Committee on Law and Justice, all of them, they have advocated for regional benches of the Supreme Court. What do we mean by a regional bench? Supreme Court should continue to operate and sit at Delhi. But apart from Delhi, it should have regional branches or regional benches in northern, southern, eastern and western India. So that I as a petitioner, if I am from Tamil Nadu, I lose a case in the district court, file an appeal before the high court, lose it there as well. Instead of going to Delhi and appeal before the Supreme Court, I should approach the regional bench of the Supreme Court, which may be in Chennai, which may be in Bengaluru, which may be in Hyderabad. So justice becomes accessible to me. Justice becomes cheaper to an individual such as me. That is where the idea of regional benches were, was given in the previous past. But Supreme Court is against the idea of regional benches, setting up regional benches. Why? There are two arguments given by the Supreme Court. One, it will affect the status of Supreme Court as a national institution. Because a national institution should be one. If there are regional benches set up in four different regions of India, then Supreme Court will lose its essence as a national institution, a status of a national institution. Second, the Supreme Court says these regional benches, they may come under the influence of local politics. And when such a question is asked, you can cite the example of what happened at the Calcutta High Court. Because the judge who ordered the CBI probe, his order was stayed by two judges of the same Calcutta High Court. And now this judge is alleging that this judge is acting at the behest of a political party, a ruling political party in the state. Which may give a sense that maybe Supreme Court is right in not allowing regional benches to be constituted in four different regions of the country. Because these regional benches come under the influence of the local politics. So if at all the reforms of the Supreme Court, this question is asked on the mains examination, one structural reform that is widely proposed is setting up of regional benches in four different regions of the country. But the argument of the Supreme Court is it will affect the status of Supreme Court as a national institution. That is why we oppose it. Also, these regional benches may come under the influence of the local politics. But this argument does not hold water. Why? Because if regional benches can come under the influence of local politics, high courts can also come under the influence of local politics. Does that mean that we should abolish all the 24 high, 25 high courts in different parts of the country? No. Why? Because there is always an option. When there is an allegation of bias, when there is a conclusive evidence that yes, a particular case is being influenced by the ruling political party in that state, that case can be transferred to another high court or that case can be transferred to the Supreme Court itself. Exactly what has happened in this case. That is how you will have to link this topic with the wider Supreme Court's structural reform of setting up regional benches. Clear? Let's look at another column, another article on page number two of the Delhi edition of the Hindu relevant for GS paper one. Who should get the credit of India's independence? Or to put it 
clearly if britain withdrew from india on 15th of august 1947 why did it withdrew in august 1947 for that who should get the credit should the credit be given to indian national congress and the mahatma gandhi or should the credit be given to someone else according to tamil nadu governor this credit should be given to not the congress not the mahatma but this credit should be given to netaji subhash chandra bose this is according to tamil nadu governor and now the tamil nadu governor has said that media has twisted my words on mahatma gandhi but let's understand this topic in great detail 9th of august 1942 a massive campaign was to be launched known as quit india bharat chhodo a day earlier at the gowalia tank in mumbai mahatma gandhi addressed a massive crowd and said i will give you a mantra do or die we will either work towards the establishment of an independent country so that we come out of enslavement or we will die in the cause of giving india its freedom mahatma gandhi further said that there will come a time where there may not be nationalist leaders to give you direction they may not be able to guide you but at that time you have to look into your conscience and follow the principle of non violence and liberate india This was on 8th of August 1942. Quit India movement, Bharat Chhodo, was to be launched on 9th of August 1942. But then, on the morning of 9th of August, all the important leaders of the Congress were arrested. Mahatma Gandhi was arrested, Sardar Patel was arrested, Pandit Nehru was arrested, and they remained. The top leadership remained in jail for many, many years. And it was during this period that Pandit Nehru, when he was incarcerated, when he was in jail. he wrote his famous book the discovery of india but be that as it may tamil nadu governor is saying during this period congress was inactive because all the top leadership the entire top leadership of the congress they were imprisoned they were incarcerated they were under arrest but during this period of quit india movement horrible human rights violations were committed against the people of india massive atrocities were committed against the people of this country but at the same time during this quit india movement new leaders emerged leaders such as biju patnaik it was this during this quit india movement that parallel governments emerged particularly at satara balia in uttar pradesh during this period there was a congress radio or azad hind radio which was led by operated by miss usha mehta it also operated long story short during this quit india movement which is considered to be a leaderless movement because the entire top leadership of the congress was in jail but then the second rung leadership emerged where people took the matters in their own hands and started running parallel governments at satara at balia and various other places it was during this period that we saw the emergence of new set of leaders which emerged on the nationalist movement stage but the congress leadership was inactive but why credit should be given to Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, according to the Tamil Nadu governor, 1938 elections were held to the presidentship of Indian National Congress, and Netaji won the elections and became the president of the Indian National Congress. 1939, Subhash Chandra Bose, Netaji decided to contest the elections again, but this time he faced an opposition in the form of Patabi Sitaramaya. who was projected by mahatma gandhi himself but who won this contest netaji subhash chandra bose and mahatma gandhi said it is not the defeat of sitaramaiah it is my personal defeat
But be that as it may, this is where lots and lots of controversies emerged, conflicts emerged between Subhash Chandra Bose and Mahatma Gandhi on the other side and other leaders of the Congress on the other side. And ultimately, Subhash Chandra Bose resigned. He was under house arrest in 1941, but he escaped from the house arrest, then went to Germany and met Hitler. Met the leaders of the Nazi party. Also met the Japanese prime minister. And then went to Singapore, where he took control of Indian National Army or Azad Hind Forge which was set up by Mr. Mohan Singh, but ultimately the leadership was passed on to Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose and it tried to take a military rule, an armed rule for the liberation of India. But then something happened, which you must have read in modern history. Japan got defeated. Japan surrendered in the Second World War on 15th of August. And this basically led to the culmination of the Second World War. But after this Second World War, or let's say even before the Second World War, there was a debate amongst the Congress leaders whether we should support the Allies, Britain and her allies, or should we push harder for India's independence. Mahatma Gandhi, Pandit Nehru, they were of the view that we should support the Britain during this war time. Because they are fighting the fascists, they are fighting the Nazis, and we should support them. Other leaders said, why should we support Britain? Even if they are fighting against fascism, they are fighting against the Nazis, but even then, they are the imperial power. They have illegally captured our land. So we should use this opportunity to mount a strong pressure on the Britain, and Britain should liberate us from its colonialism. But then... Britain took India to the Second World War as a participant. Congress ministries resigned in 1939. They protested that you have taken India to participate in the Second World War even without consulting Indians. That is why Congress ministries resigned. But be that as it may, what is it that we are discussing? If Britain ultimately withdrew India from India on August 15, 1947, for that, who should get the credit? Should it be Mahatma and the Congress party or should it be Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose? According to Tamil Nadu governor, it should be Subhash Chandra Bose. Why? Because after the Second World War got over, some important developments took place. And it is because of those developments that Britain, Britain basically left India. Not because of the Congress party, not because of Mahatma Gandhi, because the Tamil Nadu governor says, that these individuals were inactive after the Quit India movement. What were those developments which basically precipitated the withdrawal of Britain from India? INA trials. After the Second World War, all the important commanders of the Indian National Army, they were to be prosecuted in India. So they were put on a trial known as INA trials, which generated huge wave of sympathy for these INA officers. In fact, Pandit Nehru donned his barrister gown and defended some of the accused in the INA trials. So one reason why Britain left is because of the sympathy generated by the INA trials. That's number one. Number two, Royal British Air Force strikes, which took place at Karachi. Not just this, the Rin Mutiny, which spread from Karachi to Bombay to Calcutta. It is this Royal Indian Navy Mutiny, which ultimately precipitated the withdrawal of Britain from India on August 15, 1947. So according to Governor, it's not the Congress or Mahatma Gandhi who should be given credit for the withdrawal of Britain on August 15, 1947. 
but it is these developments and thanks to the efforts taken by Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose that ultimately Britain withdrew from India. But if this question is asked in your mains examination, you can't point out a single reason for the ultimate withdrawal of Britain from India. When Britain basically left India on 15th of August 1947, it was not because of one reason. For example, INA trials or the strikes of Royal British uh, Air, Airways or because of the Royal Indian Navy mutiny. It's basically because of the culmination of wide range of steps taken by the nationalist leaders for decades together. For example, historian Bipin Chandra says, Quit India movement was a historic movement, despite the fact that it failed. Failed in the sense because it was crushed in few months. But the slogan of Quit India was Bharat Chodo. You have to leave India. So any future negotiation, if at all it is possible with the Britain, that can be only on how the power is to be transferred to the Indian people. Not whether power should be transferred or not. Because that question is gone. You have to transfer power to the Indians. Now let's get on the negotiating table and discuss when. Because after Kuwait India, there is no retreat, according to Bipin Chandra. Not just this. Different organizations, different individuals played pivotal role throughout decades, throughout centuries, which ultimately led to the withdrawal of British from India. It may be Mahatma Gandhi with different ideology, different methodology. It may be Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose with different ideology and different methodology. It may be Sardar Patel and Nehru with different ideology and different methodology. But the reason Britain left on August 15, 1947 is not because of one reason. It's because of the culmination of so many things which happened in the decades. Principally also because after 1945, when the Second World War got over, Britain emerged as broke. It could not have sustained the colonialism, the imperialism in India because it would have required a lot of money which they did not have. In fact, if you look at the history, it is argued by various authors, writers, that Britain could have still continued to run India even after 1947, but for that they required educated individuals from Oxford and Cambridge, experts, Indian civil servant officers, Indian civil services officers trained from Oxford and Cambridge who would go on and who would go on and continue their dominance on the administration in India. But that was not possible. So that was another reason why British left India. That is what you need to understand from this article, Media Twisted My Words on Gandhi, says Tamil Nadu governor. Clear? Let's look at another important article. Why is Punjab in court over BSF's powers? Something has happened. October 2021, the central government, what it did, issued a notification. Because of the notification, what happened? The jurisdiction of BSF was altered. Where? In border areas in states such as Gujarat, Rajasthan, Punjab, Assam, West Bengal. What is the principal task of BSF? which was created after the 1965 war between India and Pakistan. Its purpose is, its jurisdiction is to patrol the border areas which border India with Pakistan and Bangladesh. And these are the states responsible for that. What are their powers? Their powers are arrest, seizure, confiscate, search, For example, they're patrolling the border areas 
and there is an illegal migrant coming from Pakistan or Bangladesh entering into India, BSF has the jurisdiction to arrest that individual. Or illegally arms are transported to India. You can confiscate those arms. You can seize those arms. Drugs are being transported via the border areas into India. BSF has, has the jurisdiction, the power to seize those drugs or narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances, so on and so forth. But BSF cannot prosecute these individuals who have been arrested because BSF cannot file the charge sheet. BSF has to hand over these individuals to the local police and then the local police will investigate, will file the charge sheet before the court and will prosecute them. But now what the central government did in 2021 expanded the jurisdiction of BSF. Initially, in Punjab, Assam, West Bengal, the jurisdiction was 16 kilometers. That means if this is the border area, within 16 kilometers, up to 16 kilometers of this border area, this is where the jurisdiction of the BSF would lie. That means in this area, the BSF will have the power to arrest, to seize and search. In Gujarat, this jurisdiction used to be 80 kilometers. In Rajasthan, this jurisdiction used to be 50 kilometers. But now because of this central government notification, what the central government has done, it has made the jurisdiction uniform. That means now in Gujarat, instead of 80 kilometers, the jurisdiction would be till 50 kilometers. In Rajasthan, it will remain 50 kilometers. In these states, instead of 16 kilometers, the jurisdiction will be widened to 50 kilometers so that there is uniformity. Punjab did not like this, saying this goes against federal principles. Why? Because under the distribution of powers, under Schedule 7 of the Constitution, police and law and order is under state list. So if it is 50 kilometers from the border within Punjab, these are civilian areas and in these civilian areas where there is a population, massive population also present, where people are involved in agricultural activities also, there will be clash between the state police and the BSF because both will claim jurisdiction which goes against the federal principle because police and law and order is the state subject under the distribution of powers. And ultimately, Punjab approached the Supreme Court, filed a petition under Article 131 of the Constitution. Because under Article 131, any dispute between the center and the state can be adjudicated by the Supreme Court and the decision of the Supreme Court shall be final and binding. Now the Supreme Court has decided that we will hear this matter and we will see whether this notification is against the federal principles or not. Whether there should be uniformity in the way you talk about local areas within the borders. Punjab says, don't treat us like Gujarat or don't treat us like Rajasthan. Why? Because in Gujarat, most of this 50 kilometer area, it falls in the wastelands of Kutch and Saline marshes. Similarly, when it comes to Rajasthan, this 50 kilometer within the borders, it is mostly a desert land. But when you look at Punjab, if you include 50 areas, major populated areas such as Gurdaspur, they will get under the jurisdiction of BSF violating the federal principles, going against the powers of the state police. We will have to wait and watch exactly what the Supreme Court will rule on this matter. Okay. Let's look at another matter, Western Equine Encephalitis outbreak in Argentina. Equine related to the horses, encephalitis, which basically means Inflammation of brain. What if there is inflammation of brain as well as spinal cord?
if the inflammation of brain is known as known as is called encephalitis what if spinal cord is also involved inflammation of spinal cord and the brain it is known as encephalomyelitis clear now what has happened is that after more than two decades we have seen the instance of western equine encephalitis in argentina and what is this western equine encephalitis it is a rare mosquito borne viral disease these mosquitoes they act as vectors and basically through these mosquito bites it gets transferred to horses to humans as well so what is western equine encephalitis it is basically a mosquito a rare mosquito born viral disease where these mosquitoes they act as vectors the primary mode of transmission of this virus is through these mosquitoes and it affects the horses it affects the human beings as well and now we have seen an instance in argentina which has happened after two decades more than two decades but that's not the only point what happens because of this there is an inflammation in brain but if there is an inflammation of brain as well as spinal cord we call it encephali encephalomyelitis that is something these facts are very important for your prelims examination and this particular disease is basically predominant in areas or basically affects those areas which are surrounding swampy areas and mostly the symptoms this this is an asymptomatic disease initially there are no symptoms but then over a period of time it affects the infants and adult it affects the infants and aged persons severely and may also lead to the brain damage that is what you need to understand from this newspaper article pure facts leave out the rest britain italy finland pause funding for un agency in gaza arab israeli war of 1948 which led to the displacement of a large section of palestinians basically palestinian refugees in 1948 an agency was set up known as united nations relief and works agency for palestinians this agency was established by the united nations general assembly resolution so a resolution was passed by united nations general assembly in 1948 creating this agency what is the purpose of this agency to provide relief to palestinian refugees relief in the form of education relief in the form of health benefits such benefits are to be provided to palestinian refugees and these refugees can be in gaza the west bank the jordan the syria and the lebanon and the operations this agency started operating from 1950 but how does this agency get funding the funding is given to this agency through voluntary contribution voluntary contribution by member states so all the states who are part of the united nations if they want voluntarily they will contribute to this agency so that this agency can provide benefits to palestinian refugees voluntary contribution and now this voluntary contribution has been stopped previously by united states australia and canada 
Now there are countries such as Britain, Italy and Finland. They have also paused and stopped this voluntary contribution to this agency. Why? Because Israel alleges that 12 members of this agency, they are responsible for October 7 attacks on the Israelis when Hamas launched an attack on Israelis on October 7. Basis that these three countries, previously the three other countries, they have stopped voluntary contributions to this aid agency. Clear? Let's look at another important article. Washington approves sale of F-16 jets to Turkey. Now there are three things that we have to keep in mind here. Previously it was Turkey. Now it is Turkey. The name has changed. Why, when, how? 2022, Turkey approaches the United Nations saying we want to change our name from Turkey to Turkey. Why? Because it reflects the best traditions, the ancient civilization of Turkey. Previously, it used to be known as the Ottoman Empire. Then it became Turkey, but the best name that should reflect our culture is Turkey. United Nations accepted this. Turkey replaced Turkey as the name. But there are other columnists, other writers who also say that it is because of Google search that Turkey wanted to change its name. Because when you search Turkey on Google, it displays the bird which is slaughtered and given as food during Thanksgiving or Christmas in Northern America. That is why they, the, the country wanted to change its name from Turkey to Turkey. That's not the only reason. Other experts also say that Turkey was not happy with the Cambridge definition of this word Turkey, uh, which basically means bound to fail or means uh, a silly, uh, idiotic person. That is why they wanted to change their name from Turkey to Turkey. That's number one. Number two, United States has now approved the sale of F-16 jets to Turkey. F-16, who is the manufacturer of F-16? Lockheed Martin is the manufacturer. It is from United States. It is a multi-role single engine jet. Can perform various role. It can be used for dropping bombs. It can be used for dropping relief material. It has multi-role, but it's a single engine jet. Pakistan also uses F-16. Egypt also uses F-16. Turkey also uses F-16. Does India use F-16? No. There is something known as Rafale. Can Rafale jet be compared to F-16? No. Why? Because Rafale jet, the manufacturer is the saw which is a French entity and Rafale jet is not a single engine jet, it's a twin engine jet. That is why we can't compare the Sol's Rafale with the Lockheed Martin's F-16. But is there an equivalent of F-16 by the saw? That is known as Dassault Mirage 2000 because it is this Dassault Mirage 2000 which is a single engine jet. So the equivalent of F-16 of Lockheed Martin is the Dassault Mirage 2000 which is also a single engine jet. That's point number two that I told you we need to understand from this topic. First, how Turkey became Turkey what is this F-16, how it can be compared with Rafale jet? But all this is basically happening 
because Ankara, which is the capital of Turkey, has approved the in induction of Sweden into NATO. Since Turkey has approved it, that is why as a quid pro quo, as a give and take, United States has approved F-16 F judge to Turkey. What is this NATO? North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which was set up on the basis of Washington Treaty of 1949. NATO is basically intergovernmental military alliance. And there are 31 members who are part of NATO. 29 members are from Europe. Two members are from North America. One is United States, the other is Canada. These are the two Northern American members of NATO. The remaining 29, these are European countries. And this NATO follows a practice of open door policy. What is this open door policy? Any European country, if it wants, it can get admission into NATO. And the principal objective of this NATO was to mount some sort of a challenge to Soviet Union. Because after 1945, World War, the world became bipolar. Two superpowers emerged, United States and USSR. Now, United States wanted to court countries in the Europe so that it can mount an attack on Soviet Union, so that it can restrict the influence of Soviet Union. And in 1949, an intergovernmental military alliance was created known as NATO. Intergovernmental military alliance in the sense, if any country fights or launches an attack on Canada, it means it is not an attack on Canada only. It is the attack on all the 31 member countries. So all the 31 member countries, they have the right of collective solidarity or collective defense. So you launch an attack on one member, it means you have launched the attack on all the 31 members. That is what we call intergovernmental military alliance. But open door policy in the sense, any European country, if it wants, it can get admitted to NATO. But for that, all these member countries, they have to, by consensus, agree that yes, we want to admit this country into NATO. Turkey was not so keen on admitting Sweden into NATO. Why? Because Turkey basically alleged that Sweden is providing support to some Kurds or Kurdish groups, which Ankara says, which Turkey says, these are terrorist groups. So Sweden's support to some Kurdish groups was basically a stumbling block into Sweden's entry into NATO. But now United States was imposing pressure through diplomatic means, trying to force Turkey to give up its objection to the admission of Sweden into NATO. And in response to that, in exchange of that, F-16 jets will be provided. And now the President Erdogan of Turkey has ratified that yes, we have no objection, Sweden can be admitted into NATO. But even then, Sweden may not get immediate access, membership of NATO. Why? Because there is one more country which has still not ratified the admission of Sweden into NATO, and that country is Hungary. Now, Sweden is Hungary for Hungary's approval into its admission as a NATO member. And this NATO membership has also fueled some conflicts in the recent past. For example, uh, it was alleged by Russia that Ukraine wants to be part of NATO. And if Ukraine becomes part of NATO, NATO, which is an intergovernmental military alliance, that means the neighbor of Russia would be part of this collective solidarity defense group 
which ultimately will not be good for the sovereignty and independence of Russia. That is one reason why Russia decided to invade NATO. So NATO becomes important. This open door policy becomes important for your examination. How the countries are admitted into NATO becomes important for your examination. And that is what is what do you need to know regarding this newspaper article. Now let's look at two questions for practice for your mains examination. Number one, the British decision to transfer power was not merely a response to the immediate situation prevailing in the winter of 1945-46. What was the immediate situation? The INA trials, the Royal Indian Navy mutiny, the strike by the Royal British Air Force in Karachi. So the British decision to transfer power to Indians was not in response to what was happening in 1945 and 46, but a result of their realization that their legitimacy to rule had been irrevocably eroded over the years. Discuss or comment. Question number two, comment on the role of the Supreme Court in resolving the center state disputes in a federal polity by strongly emphasizing on Article 131 of the Constitution. That is it from our newspaper analysis for today. I'll see you again tomorrow, 10 a.m in the morning with another edition of the Hindu newspaper analysis. And if you have liked the session, enjoyed these tits and bits, please do let me know in the comment section. Do not forget to press the like button, subscribe to our channel if you haven't yet, and share the links of these classes with your friends and fellow aspirants. Have a great Sunday ahead. Goodbye. Stay safe. Take care.